Hello everyone, I'm Asha Nayaswami. We're continuing with the essence of the Bhagavad Gita, Swami Kriyananda's exposition of Paramahansa Yogananda's interpretation. I have a new cup for those of you who watch every week. This new cup is a gift from the devotees in Mumbai, and I promised them I would use it from now on, and so I want to give them tribute on its inaugural performance. I was just in India. Of course, many of you watch this out of time sequence, but I was in India 2019 from July 1st until September 24th, and I visited um, several, most Delhi, Bangalore, Pune, and Mumbai of Ananda centers, and it was glorious in every respect. And this is, you know, a symbolic uh, tie of friendship between myself and all my new brothers and sisters in India. So thank you. Okay, today we have an extremely interesting part of this book. Um, the book, in the book, we're on chapter 14. The chapters of the book do not correspond to the chapters of the Gita. There are 18 chapters in the Gita. We're on chapter 14 of the book, so you can see that there's a lot more book chapters. We are actually on, we are in the middle of chapter 3 of the Gita. We are between the last one we did was uh, chapter 3, uh, stanza 9. And this is a long essay that Swami puts in before he goes to chapter 10. Uh, stanza 10 of chapter 3. And there's uh, several reasons for it, which I'll comment as we get into it. He's um, Some of the things that happen next, what Krishna is recommending to the devotee, Swami feels he needs to put into context. He's also talking about an aspect of the spiritual path that is uh, absolutely essential for all devotees to understand, for us to be able to... Um, continue to put one foot in front of the other without getting discouraged. I, I find myself, I know, I, I think in these videos, I must refer to my age quite a lot. <laughs> and it's not, uh, it's because there are certain realizations that have come to me with time, and they're realizations that I don't know how they could have come to me except through time, but I'm trying to give them back to people who are less, as I say, chronologically developed than I am, um, so that perhaps some of it, um, that you won't have to wait as long. That's the only way I can put it. Although I remember quite clearly, you know, that time itself was the way I, I came to understand. Now what am I going to say? Oh yes, what I'm going to say is, what time has given me is extraordinary faith in this spiritual path. And what, it, what time has also given me is the realization of how enormous the ups and downs of life appear when we're in them, and how um, unimportant they look when we look back on them. Now I'm going to take this all the way to something that Swamiji said, which is much bigger than anything I can speak from, from experience. But at the time he said it, there was so much magnetism in what he said that it's been imprinted on my consciousness ever since. Well, there's interesting because he said it when I was probably in my 20s. So maybe youth isn't so bad after all. But let me go on with this. He was giving a satsang at his dome at Ayodhya, which is the section of Ananda village, <coughs> where Swamiji's house is. For those of you who've seen pictures or been to visit, it's now called Crystal Hermitage. When uh, he built it in 1971, and until it was rebuilt as Crystal Hermitage, which is around 1985, <clears throat> it was a single dome. And if you visit the structure now, that single dome is now the living room of uh, something that has a lot of a lot more going on there. And it was a single dome, and it sat right on the edge of the hill. There was no garden around it. There were for a long time. There were not even any stairs leading down to it, you just walk down the hillside. There was a little path through the woods, but that's how everything was in those days. You parked, maybe it was an eighth of a mile up the hill, and then came down the hill to this dome. You walked right in, and you were in the living room. And he used to give weekly satsangs for the community. The community was about 40 people, maybe 50 would come. 
there were more than that living on the Ananda property, but uh, not everyone would come during the 70s. This may well have been before much of the community burned down in 1976. That winnowed out some of those whose paths really had diverged from what, where Ananda was going. And it, it, there was no electricity. He, I, he, pus, he probably had a generator then for his electric typewriter, but we didn't use it for light. It was just, there was no point. It was too expensive and there was no point because we had propane light. But propane light, you know, made a, a circle of light. So there were lots of shadow, shadows. I, I'm saying all of this because there was an atmosphere, especially in the winter when it would get dark early and we would come in bundled up against cold weather and set our things down in a big heap, take off our boots and our jackets and our mufflers when it was really cold, and then gather around with this wood stove and this propane light and Swami sitting there with his back to this huge window, which is still the characteristic feature. The window looks out on uh, wilderness. There's a national forest or something, it's wilderness. Or it look out on snow or rain or moon. And when we would be there with Swamiji, especially when he would start talking, it's just you, you, time and space, you really, one had no idea. One was a dot of consciousness sharing consciousness, and pretty much everything else was irrelevant to the point of barely remembered. And of course some evenings, uh, for reasons, I don't know whether it was Swamiji's consciousness, more likely it was mine, were just more vivid and more vivid in our awareness. And we had been through one of those evenings, I have no idea now, what the subject was, what he was talking about. The content of the satsang itself is gone, but I remember his comment afterwards. Swamiji was looking at us, and I always sat close to him. I, uh, my mind is restless, and if there were too many people between me and Swamiji, their consciousness would begin to interfere with my concentration on him. So I always place myself in such a way, if at all possible, so that there were no people between him and me. I wasn't trying to, I, I, I rarely sat front and center, but I would just sit where there was no people in between. And I remember just seeing him, and so I could see his face very clearly. And there was a look in his eye which made my uh, sense of displacement from time and place look childish compared to wherever he was, which we had all been feeling that night. And he looked out at us and he said, uh, he said several things. He said in such a loving way, you're going to get it right sooner or later, meaning we're going to realize God sooner or later. He said, why waste a few million years? It was such a practical question. And then he said, when, when liberation comes, when, when, I don't know, you have the story of the Buddha sitting under the um, Bodhi tree, and Bodhi tree, is that right? When it's sitting under the tree, whatever it was, and, uh, and just refusing to move until he was freed. So you have this sense of the moment in which it comes. Swami said, when liberation comes, you look back at all your lifetimes, millions and millions of lifetimes, not millions of years, I heard Swami say recently, but millions of lifetimes. He said, and you can see that all of it is just a dream. You know, when one, when one wakes up from a dream, there can be an impression left, but there's just this realization that was just a dream. I know sometimes some of my subconscious issues have asserted themselves in dreams and I've had dreams where I've gotten in a lot of trouble and then I was just going to have to work my way out of some karmic mess that I created and then I wake up and oh, it's such a relief to realize that it's not happening. I, you know, it's, I'm, not in, I'm not in such a deep karmic mess. I'm just fine. I'm going to have to... <coughs> 
excuse me, sneeze. Um, and uh, he said, when you, when you look back at all those millions of lifetimes and you realize they're all just a dream, and I think of the relief that I have over just one little night dream in which all these complicated circumstances seem to have grabbed me, and to be able to look back over millions of lifetimes when all those complicated circumstances seem to have grabbed me, and to be able to say with the same sense of relief, oh, it was just a dream. It was never, it was never real. It was never happening. And he said, and it just all, none of it matters. It just fades away. But, he said, as you look back over those millions of lifetimes, he said, what you will see is those moments when you are actually in touch with the divine. It's fascinating to think about because the progress, and this is, this is what this whole uh, ch- uh, essay that we're talking about today is about, progress, the progress on the spiritual path, the phrase Swami uses is directional, directional development. This is a phrase he often used when he would talk to us. It's directional, which is meaning we're on a journey toward a goal. And how straight we travel and whether we even turn back and then go forward again. However it is, we're we're gradually inching toward this final state of liberation that Swamiji was talking about there. So all along that, there are going to be moments. There are going to be moments of divine contact. Because that's what keeps us going. What keeps us going is that we have these moments of divine contact and we wake up. We just realize, oh my gosh, this is, what, this is what I was born to do. This is who I really am. This is where my happiness comes from. And then all the other trivial preoccupations that absorb so much of our time and energy, we just see them in proportion. We may not be at the point yet where they, they assume a dreamlike quality and don't exist, but we see them in proportion. We have incarnations where we meet great saints. As we develop the relationship with our guru, certain incarnations we will probably incarnate physically with him, not nearly as many as we'll have without him, because uh, the guru just doesn't have to incarnate as many times as we do. And we have that touch, and then that touch carries us. Swamiji quotes in here an ancient uh, tradition, an aphorism, from the tradition of India, one moment in the company of a saint will be your raft over the ocean of delusion. One moment of awakening because of the clarity that that connection can bring, then, then it, it becomes the, the, um, the, the, the rock in the river. And we just keep circling around and coming back and coming back. Rock in the river is not the right image. It's more like pole star. Everything gets measured in relationship to that. So those are, that's what we remember, because that really happened. That was truth. That was eternal truth. Everything else was just shadow and light. But when we transcend the duality of this creation, which we break through periodically, that stays with us forever, because that's really who we are. When the, when the delusive self is gone, then the true self is left. So what Swami's talking about here is he's talking about directional development and he's talking about, he's trying to get us to understand that um, spiritual development is progressive. I mean, that's too obvious, isn't it? On a path of discipleship where you have someone who is self-realized and he is guiding us along that path of self-realization and we realize that the path of self-realization is an experience of ever-expanding awareness and each of those stages of progressively ever-expanding awareness brings with it an entirely different relationship to ourselves, to our egoic self, to our surroundings, to our relationships. It becomes self-evident that in the course of our life experience, people are at very different stages. And uh, uh, sometimes 
we contradict that by by reminding people that it serves you not at all to compare. It, it doesn't, it's not linear. You can't really see that he's advanced and she is, and then she's three quarters of a, a lifetime further behind than this one. I mean, it's not a linear progress. But self-evidently, you meet people who are more free. They're just more free in the way uh, they're, they're, the limitations of delusion don't hold them until you meet souls that are perfectly free. And in our own progress, we also observe um, that we become more and more free. I was speaking to someone recently and talking about a certain sort of, I guess I would call it an attitude of being a victim, although that's not my dominant way of thinking, but in this case, I had a sense of being a victim. And I remarked, but I don't anymore. And I said, because when you, you know, when your heart gets tromped on enough, then it it kind of drives out a lot of darkness. It can, because one begins to, let me think what would I would say, one begins to have a more realistic sense of oneself, superficial things are taken away, and when one suffers, one has a deeper sense of compassion. And Compassion is how we actually become free. Because when we have compassion, we no longer judge others. It's just that we see everybody, everybody is fighting a serious fight. And if in their effort to move themselves forward, they accidentally um, push me aside, I can understand why that happens. There's just no reason to take it personally, as Master said. You know, we just have compassion for each other. So gradually, one, one simply comes to a greater state of freedom where less about this world binds us. Of course, perfect freedom is something entirely other. But nonetheless, you know, development is directional. And so the whole world, it, it, it's just an obvious reality. It's very helpful for us to realize that for the reasons that Swami is putting this essay in. Starting in the next section, which is, you know, three... Uh, three stanza ten, I guess, or something like that. Um, Krishna starts talking about yagyas. I hope I'm saying that word right. Fire ceremonies, rituals, all these different ways that we can work with higher and more subtle forces, and we can begin to um, to draw on the power of 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 uh, the gods and goddesses and the devas and the angels, and it. Swamiji really wants us to understand sort of why Krishna is advocating this and what Krishna really means. And Swamiji also because this Gita commentary of Master's, when Master wrote this commentary, and these are all of, all of Master's ideas in Swami's words, uh, Master was also aware of how the Gita and his commentary on the Gita fits into the whole trajectory of what you might call the history of spirituality on this planet. And when the Buddha came and incarnated, now to, to just back up to make this clear, the way Swamiji explains this, all masters, all, all self-realized masters, all avatars, which are uh, the true religions of the world are all founded by avatars because they have a, a vision of absolute truth and that's the revelation that they bring. And if they have a vision of absolute truth, then they all have to have the same vision. You can't have multiple simultaneous absolutes. You can't have multiple simultaneous eternities. They all speak the same truth, but they, they, they present it according to the needs of the time in which they incarnate, the balancing energy, the corrective that's needed. And the corrective is needed. That's why the avatar is called. The avatar is called to incarnate because the world needs a, a new articulation of the same truth, but an articulation that matches the times. And also, the avatar is, is forever concerned with his disciples. And so his disciples, um, he also, his message is for his disciples. And the context of his incarnation is for the benefit of his disciples. For example, Master came to the West. Master came to America. 
Master came in the 1920s to America, and he brought with him a lot of his disciples. And many of those disciples had not habitually lived in such a materialistic age. And it, it was a challenge for many of them to live, and some of them uh, succumbed to delusions that they wouldn't have been exposed to in uh, Himalayan caves. But they were karmas that they had to work out. Master did two incarnations, I believe I mentioned this recently here, did two incarnations that we know of when he was master, when he was William the Conqueror in England and when he was Ferdinand III in Spain. Both of those incarnations, especially Ferdinand's incarnation, his entire adult incarnation was war. He lived and was at war. That's basically what he did. He pushed the Moors out of Spain and held it as a Catholic country. That's basically what he did. And he had to fight continuously. So all his disciples, mostly what they did, they were all at war. Well, war is a, a powerful learning tool. So he got to bring with him all those disciples who needed war. And in the same with William, although not quite as continuously as Ferdinand, but it was a huge, that's why they often call him William the Conqueror. The more positive say, thing is to say William the Great. But he was at war because that's what his disciples needed. And his message was entirely different than it was when he was Arjuna or when he was Yogananda. So when Buddha came, as Swamiji describes it here, um, people had become very passively dependent on what the word is karmakand, which means rituals that are done by Brahmins that you pay them to do. And Buddha spoke very strongly against that because the, because the aberration that had set in was passivity, which is I will just pay the priest, the priest will do the ritual, and then I don't have to attune myself, I just pay him to do it on my behalf, and then his attunement or the power of the mantras, and of course it depends on whether the priest has any power, but the, the, the power of the mantra, if properly done, the, the benefit will accrue to me. So Buddha really spoke very strongly against this. So Swamiji felt the need here, Master felt the need here, to explain the context of what Krishna was doing, because he's starting to tell us to do all these rituals, which in the age in which he was speaking, it wasn't something that the average citizen can do. It was still a, a priestly profession. But Krishna also talked a great, a great deal about the necessity for us to attune ourselves, and that the ritual has power if through the, the mantra and if through the pop, proper ceremonies, the devotee who is seeking the inspiration also attunes himself. And then uh, Swamiji is also wanting us to understand because the Gita talks about angels and devas and gods and goddesses. And we sort of, it, it can sound a lot like superstition. So Swamiji wants to give a modern context to it. He also wants to bridge the Western bias against deities. And they always, you know, the Westerners who want to mock the Indian deities always talk about the elephant-headed god, which is Ganesha, which of course is one of the most beloved gods in the uh, Hindu pantheon, and almost everybody has a Ganesha somewhere. I have, I have two of them. I have two little, what I call pocket Ganeshas, tiny Ganeshas, which sit right in front where I do all my work because he's the remover of obstacles, and God knows I need his help. So, but whenever those who, especially of a Christian or a Jewish persuasion, who are deeply inculcated with the idea that idols are not, not God's uh, preferred method, uh, Swamiji wants to build a picture for us. So then he talks about directional development, and he he, earlier in this book, he's talked about the caste system. Now, today, and for quite some time, the caste system has been made hereditary, and the caste system is an instrument of oppression, where the privileged try to oppress the underprivileged. So one has to take that entire construct and just take it out of your mind and start over with the caste system. The caste system was intended to be uh, not hereditary, not rigid, but rather a very clear way of understanding that development is directional. I mean, it, unless one is, is absolutely blinded by one's prejudices, 
it's self-evident that in the realm of the ego, in the realm of human beings acting with egoic consciousness, there's a huge, huge differences in awareness. Swamiji speaks very interestingly in here about how, you know, we um, all individual souls, the jiva, progresses through all the stages of animal life. He even says here, life evolves upward from levels lower um, even than apparent animation, he says. The wiggling worm, relatively high on the scale of consciousness, compared to a rock, for example, or a plant, may become next, he says, a moth, then a bird, a mammal, and after a long upward journey, a human being. I was interested, a worm, a moth, a bird, a mammal. I've often wondered sort of what the sequence was. <laughs> I'm sure it, that sequence was not random, but was how Master described it. But only after a long upward journey gets to the point of awareness where a human body is possible. But then Swamiji talks about, this is just so interesting to contemplate, when you first have a human ego, it's quite different than an animal ego. Master, I heard Master on a recording, I think it was a recording about reincarnation. He was talking about how animals uh, cannot incur any sin, even though they're promiscuous sexually and indifferent to uh, their responsibility as parents. Many of them are, not all of them. Um, they, they cannibalize other animals. I guess cannibalize means to eat, means to eat your own kind, but some of them eat their own kind. Um, they kill, they murder all the time. And these things which for a human being uh, would be serious um, strikes against our happiness, the animals just run right through it because there's, their ego development is such that they're, they're running purely on instinct without any free choice that makes them responsible. Now, by the time any animal is in close proximity to a human being, and that even means when Jane Goodall goes out to a, a, a group of gorillas and spends a lot of time studying them, those gorillas are now in the constant presence of a human vibration. And one of the ways that animals evolve is by their relationship to human consciousness. Because you see, everything is vibrational. And the human ego is a, is a more elevated vibration than the animal ego. Not that human beings necessarily behave better than animals, but the awareness of self and free choice is what makes a human beings more advanced. Now, what I was wanting to say is that any animal that is in close proximity to a human being, especially a dearly loved and much you know, cared for pet who actually no longer lives in the animal world. He no longer has to hunt. He no longer has to worry about being eaten. It, you know, his, his whole life is really almost human. And so then people will naturally say, my dog, my cat, my parakeet, my pet rat, my lizard, you know, they behave very differently because they are within that realm they have advanced very high. And so even though they're still in an animal body, their proximity to human beings means they're about to tip and tip into. Um, so Swamiji says, but when the jiva first has a human ego, he says at first it has to work and explore that ego. It has to learn how to use it. And it has to learn how not to just be instinctual. It has to learn how to be aware and to take responsibility and to make decisions. And of course, with increasing awareness of self also comes increased suffering. And we project upon animals a lot of human understanding, and some of it is true. Much of it is true. We can't dismiss animals. But there's also a lack of personal identification with their own experience that makes their suffering less acute. Whereas human beings, especially, has become more and more aware, we become exquisitely aware of our own reality and therefore much more vulnerable um, even to heat and cold and to hunger and thirst, what to speak of pain. And then we can also experience 
you know, on, on so many levels, emotional pain. I was speaking at the very beginning about, you know, a realization that I don't have to just, I don't have to feel badly if people don't treat me the way I want them to treat me. It's like, so what? It's their reality. They're doing it. I have compassion because I myself, in my own delusions, have treated other people badly. But it, it doesn't have to be personal. It's just everybody acting as best they can and bumping into each other. I don't know how more colorfully to put that. But what happens is, when we're in a human body for a while, first we just explore it. In the Festival of Light every week, um, we go through this whole saga of this little bird which represents the soul's long journey. The bird is, the bird is sent out from God with this holy mission to be attuned to God, to share what he gets. But the bird begins to enjoy. You know, he begins to enjoy being able to fly around and make his own decisions and choose. Because up until this time, I mean, the bird is an allegory because he's still an animal. But in the evolution of the soul, um, from the animal stage, where we just didn't have any understanding to how to control it, suddenly we can control all these things, and the, or seemingly. And the more aware we get, the more we think we can control. And we like that feeling. And we begin to relish that feeling. And that's what the Festival of Light says. The little bird, you know, enjoyed the power that he had. And he thought, why should I give this power away? This is mine. I'm liking this. But then the bird, representing us, the more aware we become, the more ways we have to suffer. And then gradually that suffering also increases our awareness and makes us begin to think about what we're doing. And so coming back to the caste system, the four castes, the Shudra, the Vaishya, the Kshatriya, the Brahman, which are characterized by the peasant, the merchant, the soldier king, and the priest, are different stages of the individual's relationship to his own individuality. The Shudra condition, represented by the peasant, which means the one who works physically, whose, whose primary identification is physical. Um, and, and that's where pleasure comes, that's where pain comes. And there's just not an awareness of ideals or of refinement or of art or, or doing things because it's right to do it. It's just, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm tired. If I don't work, the master's going to, you know, the master's going to hit me with a stick. And there's a whole lot that goes with all of that, which... There's, there's countless videos that I myself have given that are on the YouTube channel under the subjects. I don't know what they would be. Karma, reincarnation. You might even look up caste system. They might even be there. There's much more that could be said that I won't say here. But gradually, the, the shudra the, begins to realize they, that by his own actions, he can influence his destiny. And instead of just working methodically with, with physical realities, his mind begins to wake up. And he begins to realize there's a more efficient way to do this work. I could create another enterprise that might bring me more of what I want and take less effort on my part or be more pleasant because less physical. In other words, I can begin to influence my environment. That's what the Vaishya begins to understand. By the use not only of my body but also of my mind, I can begin to control the world around me. And so the Vaisha begins to control the world around him by, um, by cleverness, by mental cleverness, and by hard work. And then that's a, a much greater state of awareness. So that's the level, you know, the, the Vaisha level. But what we're still thinking on the Vaisha level is it, it's always still, what about me? And it's, and it's always trying to make it work for me in my way. And that's the merchant. The merchant will give fair value, but only if for fair value received. But when the Vaisha sort of gives and takes and measures over and over again, he may accidentally discover that there's great joy in being generous, and there's great joy in being unselfish, and that love given just for the sake of giving love is actually more pleasurable than always measuring and trading. And then the the uh, Vaishya begins to move into the Kshatriya. And the Kshatriya is the, the soldier is the ideal image, but forget the violence of the soldier. What the soldier represents is 
dedica- is, is such complete dedication to a cause that one is willing to discipline one's own inclinations to the point of sacrificing your very life because you believe in it. And the, uh, the ideal ruler, the ideal king, is one who is completely selfless and only serves. The Kshatriya realizes that my joy comes from selfless service in conformance with an ideal. You see, the Shudra can't even imagine an ideal, what to speak of disciplining himself to it. The Kshatriya is entirely bound by ideals, and he can't understand all this weighing and measuring and only giving as good as you get. It's my joy to sacrifice for that which I believe. And then the Kshatriya elevates until you realize that the one, one true principle to which I must conform is the will of God. And then we become a priest. And what this disca- deci- describes is the soul's long journey from when we first enter a physical body until we become perfectly attuned with the will of God. And at every stage along the way, we are benefited in two ways in relation to those who are behind us and those who are in front of us in terms of the, their expanded awareness. When we can put ourselves in the company of those who, whose awareness is, is greater than ours, we are influenced by those vibrations. Because you see, this whole world is nothing but vibrations, different levels of vibration. And if, if our goal is to refine and, and expand and open ourselves to higher and higher vibrations, all of the scriptures speak of the primary importance of the company we keep. So the more we can be in the company of those who are um, uh, strongly established in the vibration we're just reaching for, um, the, the greater the likelihood that we will be able to understand, interiorize it, and make it our own. And from the point of view of the one who is, uh, has greater awareness, serving those who are striving, who are close to you and are striving, um, expands the heart in generosity and compassion. The, the one turning back to help, though, and Swami speaks of that in here, must be very impersonal because one can always be influenced in a downward direction just as easily as one can be influenced in an upward direction. So if we're, if we're merely mixing upward, then there is great benefit. If we're also mixing downward, with, which many people feel called to do, it's a, it's a missionary calling, so to speak, or just a serviceful calling. Uh, I mean, it, it's a perfectly valid life to serve only through prayer and meditation. But many of us are called to participate in the world in a way of trying to, to help others understand and appreciate what, what we have learned. This is my entire life and has been for decades, that Swamiji gave me a great deal and my uh, obligation, my privilege, is to, to give it to others. But he says we must love others impersonally, meaning that we're not doing it for what they can give to us. You see, we can't go back to being vices. Oh, I love to teach because I love how people compliment me. You know, I love to give classes because everybody just rushes around and really loves me. I feel so wise and wonderful whenever I get to expound on the teachings. Then we're becoming vicious. We're not living anymore by the ideals. And we're not following the will of God because we're taking the power of those teachings and we're using it for self-aggrandizement. But if we offer impersonally, and Swamiji put it in such a beautiful way, he said when he... First of all, Swami said he never thinks of himself as a teacher. He only thinks of himself as a friend. And I I try to use the same vocabulary. I give classes is how I put it. Because that word teacher is just a little fraught. Um, But he said whenever he would lecture, he said he would always feel that he was lecturing to his guru. He was always lecturing to master. And when he said this to other disciples, they were so puzzled. Like, how can you be teaching master that just doesn't make any sense and and this is how swami explained it which is beautiful he said the guru and whether these souls are drawn to masters specifically as the guru but masters they're there in front of him so master is who swami is devoted to 
It's like, like Master. The Master lives in the heart of every devotee. And it's that uh, vibrational force which is gradually awakening the truth seeker to ever, ever greater levels of awareness. So when Swami um, speaks to a crowd of people, he's speaking to that potential awakening in every one of them. And so he's not thinking about them as egos and as personalities, but only as, as their divine potential. And the, the loving commitment, the, the love and faith that vibrationally he would extend to people whenever he would talk was for the God within them, you see. And then it just becomes this flow of divine energy. And now this is all, we're just all talking in a human way about human development and human egos. But what, where this relates to where we are in the Bhagavad Gita and where, where we're going to come to with... Um, uh, the rituals and Krishna talking about the devas and the angels and so on, is that um, that evolution continues beyond the human. And um, Master and Swamiji have said, you know, just the, the whole idea of, of Swami talks about devas and fairies um, and angels and nature spirits and also demons and devils that the, the visible spectrum of human life is not the entire spectrum of vibrational expression for sentient beings. In Autobiography of a Yogi, in uh, the chapter of Sri Yukteswar's Resurrection, in which Sri Yukteswar talks about the astral world, he makes a reference to fairies and gnomes and mermaids um, and, you know, just all of these creatures that we tend to think of as mythical, mermaids is always the one that just, you know, I guess it's just because one can't get over the idea that you, that you have to breathe air and you can't breathe underwater. But that the idea that mermaids actually exist, I've just, when, I mean, I read autobiography quite a few times before I realized that he was saying that mermaids exist. I just passed over it and, and, and didn't take it literally. When I asked Swami about it, I said, do we, like, do we, after we're finished being humans, do we have to go be mermaids? Are we mermaids before we're humans? I mean, do we live lives as fairies? Swamiji didn't give me a definitive answer, but he gave me an interesting answer, which is he said he, he thought, and I, I don't want to be too definitive about this, but he said he thought the phrase he used was separate lines of development, which would imply that there would be mermaid avatars that you could just go through the mermaid tra track, or maybe you go through the nature spirit track. Now, all of this is just to, to take down the walls, the narrow walls of our thinking, and to realize that there are many subtle vibrational expressions. Now, I think Swami has a phrase here. Let me see if I can see it. No, I'm not, I don't, I, I'm not going to be able to find the phrase, but he just talked about the wide variety of, of forms that consciousness can express in. And it, it, whatever is required for the individual jiva to progress through its delusions into absolute freedom, they all exist. And the same, um, what you might call, organizational pattern <laughs> is everywhere. There's a phrase in the Bible, as above, I believe it's from the Bible, but maybe it's a Greek phrase, as above, so below. And there's just a few words to that, but what that means is that whatever is true in the higher realms is true in, is recognizably present in the lower realms at all. And so, as, as well. So this progressive development just keeps progressing. And so a person may not have material karma, let's say, but so they live in the astral world, but they need to help. And so maybe the people they help are in the material world. So then you have angels. You have visible in the, a, a, a glimpsed in the material world. Every so often something happens where one is, is either, either actually sees or is manifested in front of you, a visible form, but it's not a material form. It doesn't behave like a material form. It dematerializes. 
or or we just see worlds that sudden realization of all these other subtle worlds and and what all the masters are trying to get us to do is to cooperate with these subtle levels and so many of these rituals and so on that um, have come down from higher ages are working vibrationally in relationship to these more subtle forms of consciousness to harmonize ourselves with them or with forces and I'm not capable of defining at all you know the force of fire the force of wind these are all um, part of God's consciousness you know and many traditional peoples were able to harmonize themselves with all these forces in ways that seem truly remarkable you know rain dances uh, Native American rain dances for example there's remarkable stories of how these things just happen in Autobiography of a Yogi um, Master talks about on uh, the solstice day I believe it was um, or maybe it was to celebrate uh, the coming of Dwapara Yuga but Master talks about having to take all the ashramites from uh, Sri Yukteswar's ashram in a walk around the city of Puri where the ashram was and it was very hot and there, there, it was going to be difficult to walk on the sand because the sand was so hot. And so Sri Yukteswar said it won't be a problem. And so a rainstorm, just a light cooling rain, lasts the, the length of their parade so that it's very comfortable for them to walk because the ground and the sand is all cooled. And then when the uh, parade is over, the rain stops. There's the story that Oliver Black tells about Master inviting him out to go for a car ride. Master looks outside and it's absolutely raining, as they say, cats and dogs. They, you know, they would be in the car, but all they would be able to see would be the sloshing water around the car. So he, he decides, well, Master wants me to go out for a ride. So he walks just a few steps from his room to outside the building. And when he steps outside, it's perfect sunshine and the ground isn't even wet. And Master sort of looks at Oliver, as, as Oliver told the story, and smiles. Master smiles at Oliver, and he says, just for you, Oliver. <laughs> it's just like they can just play with these forces. So people with power and people with insight developed ways to, to, to bring the angelic beings. And dark black musicians developed ways to bring the devils in. These things really work. And there, there's real power there that we would, we mustn't become devoted to it as a substitute for the effort to, to be personally in tune. But we would also be, why would we not take whatever help we can get? That's essentially how, how uh, Swamiji would say it. You know, every week, Master didn't bring a lot of, of ritual um, with him from India. I mean, he was well versed in all the rituals. He he knew um, from this life and many others. You know, he could have brought as much of that as he wanted to, but he brought just a little. He brought just a couple of mantras and a little bit of fire ceremony, which he would occasionally do. And that's exactly what Swamiji brought to us. He didn't bring elaborate rituals or pujas or anything like that. And he didn't bring deities. Master didn't bring deities to the West. Um, but that didn't mean he didn't respect these forces and work with them on subtle levels, especially the angelic forces. He um, he brought so so at Ananda we ha we do basically one fire ceremony and fundamentally mostly two mantras. But Swamiji went to the trouble to teach us the Om Hring Kling Krishnaya Namaha mantra. Om Hring Kling Krishnaya Namaha. It's a bij mantra, Swamiji says, and the, the sound of that, it destroys obstacles. Om, ring, kling, krishnaya, namaha. And I'm sure my accent isn't perfect, but that's how I say it. And uh, at many different times when we've been faced with obstacles, when we were in the middle of all that litigation where there was so much against us, um, every week after our kirtan, we'd sit down and we'd um, go through at least 108 I'm not sure whether we did more than 108, but we went through, we did Om Hring Kling to remove the obstacle of the litigation that we were facing. And we all felt a powerful 
sense of energy there because these things are true. We do the Gayatri Mantra and we do, I always call it Triambakam, I can't remember now exactly what it's called, but the two mantras that you see on Sunday service and at other times. Now let me think, I had another thought that I lost in there. <clears throat> let me just see what else I have going here. And the other side of it is, of course, that, you know, high, as Swami put it this way, high consciousness people naturally attract higher astral and spiritual entities to help them, and low consciousness people attract low consciousness entities to help them. I remember that people at Ananda Village in the early years were quite, um, they tended not to be tidy, and they tended to leave, they just weren't. They didn't, many people were not living at a very refined level. And Swami Chidananda of the Divine Life Society came to visit, and he walked through this certain area that was really not as it should be. And he just said, disorder attracts lower astral entities. And, uh, you know, just like, oh my gosh, you know, if we live in, in sloppy conditions and disorderly conditions and don't create beauty and order around us, he said, the kinds of beings that thrive in that kind of darkness will want to be where you are, and you'll feel pulled down by them. When Swamiji was fixing Crystal Hermitage, and it was necessary for the, for the pattern he had for the gardens outside, the several big trees had to be taken down. And there was a certain alarm among a number of people in the community that we were taking down those big trees. And one woman who was particularly distressed about it, this, uh, this discussion is in Swami's book, Divine Friendship, this letter is in there. She, um, she decided that she would ask the trees how they felt about it. And she went out into a, a particular one of her favorite places on Ananda's land, which was uh, more wild. And she talked to the trees, and she really felt they answered her, and she, she's attuned that way that she would. And they basically explained to her that it's not personal with us. You know, we're, we're, serve, we're here to serve, and if our time is up, it can be taken away. It's, it's not like we cling to life the way the human being clings to life. And, and we're happy to give up our lives in order to elevate. And, and the way Swami put it was, um, you know, the devas want to create beauty on this earth. And when we're, we're shifting nature for, for more refined beauty, the devas flock to help us. And, and the, the plant world itself wants to cooperate with us. It's a very interesting way to put it. And Swami was saying that because we've become so materialistic in this age, we've just become so convinced that matter is the only reality. And Swami contrasts with the fact that science is telling us that matter is not the only reality. In fact, matter isn't even real. It's just energy. The, as, as Swami puts it, we have to expand our sense of what it means to be a human being, to, to, to be as big as, as the way science has begun to understand creation itself. It just, it, it's not what it seems. But, but the overarching trend of our, our global culture is to such a materialistic focus that we're just losing connection with all these subtle forces. And, you know, the planet itself is beginning to um, rebel. And you can draw that, well, the greenhouse gas from the automobiles are this or that. But what's really happening is the planet itself is rebelling because we no longer respect Gaia as a living entity. We no longer respect the nature spirits and the devas that are there to help us. We no longer respect the natural order. And so what uh, is necessary for our spiritual life is that we attune ourselves much more deeply to all of these subtle forces and try to live in harmony with them. It was a big part of Master's mission, especially nature. I mean, when you think about how many, Swami calls attunement to nature not unique to America, but characteristic of an America. How many of the images of Master's songs and poems and how many of the images in Swamiji's music are all of the natural world. And in appreciating the natural world, we attune ourselves to the subtle realities around us, and then when we begin to live in appropriate harmony. You know, um, many rituals are about 
just giving back to the earth instead of just taking, giving to the wild creatures instead of just taking, harmonizing ourselves in gratitude to the sun and to the rain. And then all these, uh, when Swamiji um, created a wedding ceremony, which he did in the mid-80s, he put into it that we have water, we have fire, we have earth, and we have air. And he, he, he wrote a song for that wedding cer- ceremony. Woodland Davis, you Davis of woodland and mountain and stream, you know, be, be with us in blessing this night. I mean, this is a wedding ceremony, and he's, he's trying to, to elevate um, our human experience to include the natural world and to draw those blessings into us. We ignore them at our peril. You know where, where I live in California, the, there's fires burning again. And uh, the fires are causing the PG&E company, the electrical company, to shut off power to thousands of people so that the wires won't start more fires. So, I mean, suddenly everybody's life on a huge level is being interrupted because America um, is not trained <laughs> to not have its... Uh, what it wants in front of it. You know, I've, I've lived in parts of India where the electricity going off for hours every day is just part of what happens. But in America, we don't expect this and we just go to pieces when this happens. But this is just the way the earth is being. Global warming, climate change, all of these things. Here I am, is near the end of October and I live near the San Francisco Bay Area. We're having record warm weather. It's lovely. It's absolutely lovely weather from the point of view of just a human being, except that it, it signals essentially the end of life as we know it, because it's just everything is shifting. We need to be in harmony with these things. And this is where the next sections of the Gita will take us. Now, whether we actually take up rituals or not, what the, what the, as, we'll, as we'll talk about when we start discussing those. It's not that we need to find a pujari and have him come into the middle of our living room and break coconuts against the wall and light a fire necessarily, but we need to understand what the attunement is that is represented by these rituals, and we need to internalize that attunement. And and there's a great deal you'll see in the coming chapters about fire and, you know, offering our life force into that fire. That's what we're going to be talking about. In our Festival of Light every week, um, as we do the arati and the light bearer is holding a candle to, um, in, 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 uh, in service to everyone, but it's just one person holding it, but representing everyone. Lord, we offer up the little light that is in us into thy blazing light of infinity. Grant us the grace to know thee and make us ever increasingly pure channels of thy love to all. Now that's the real fire ceremony. We offer up the little light, symbolized by the candle, the little light that is in us into thy blazing light of infinity, so that we can burn up all our limitations. And we, we can bring to bear in this effort, you know, we, can, we can call upon all those who are more subtle and more advanced than us to help us through this far more than we know. We are surrounded by angelic beings who are are hovering and waiting and taking every opportunity they can to inspire us with uplifted thoughts, to give us courage, to open doors, to show us the way. And even the least receptivity and effort on our part to attune ourselves to, to something bigger than ourselves just opens us to a, 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 a river, a flood, a, 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 a powerful flowing river of grace. And it's that grace ultimately that will take us to where we want to be. God bless you. <laughs>